Okay, here we go. Third time's a charm. Okay, we're back with Kong's Corner. I'm reading Harry Potter every single day for everybody online. Uh, and this is Dexter. Can you hear me? Everybody can hear me. Okay, you'll, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, I'm gonna up upload the lives, right? I, I had two times before this when I tried starting. The first time the video didn't work. The second time my mic bunked out. I don't know what's going on. But yeah, anyway, I'm happy to be back. I'm happy to be uh, connecting with everybody again. Basically, uh, what happened was I moved for two weeks. I didn't read, read once. The electricity bunked out in this room, had to get that fixed. And then, cranked my neck like crazy, had to go to the ER for a full week. I was on morphine, just lying there. I couldn't lie down and sleep. I woke up every 20 minutes. I, um, I couldn't eat and swallow without these muscles killing me like crazy. It was insane, and I couldn't move my head at all. I, I mean, I still have some pain when I'm doing this, but it's much, much, much better. Um, so I'm so happy to be back. It, 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 I know it's a long time. I had to practice some of the voices before I started this too to get back into it. Uh, so welcome to those of you who it's your first time on Kong's Corner. We're happy to have you there. Some people message me and say, it's my first time. So I think it was Camilla and Anna. I saw in the chat that it's your first time here. Welcome, we're happy to have you here. Um, greetings from Germany, from Tapatan Peter. Hey Peter, well, uh, willkommen, froh dass du hier bist. And uh, we're gonna get right back into reading everybody. Um, wh wh where do we leave off? Okay, so we're at chapter 31, The Owls. Before this, uh, Ron just s saved the day apparently when he was playing Quidditch. Uh, but Hermione and Pete, uh, Peter, <laughs> Hermione and Peter, Harry Peter, Harry Peter weren't there because they had to go into the forest with Hagrid to um, mess around with Hagrid's big dumb brother. Um, what, was, what was his name again? Grop. 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 Yeah, Grop, uh, who ha Hagrid was taking, taking care of. But Hagrid thinks he's going to be uh, let go by Umbridge, who is the current... Uh, head mistress, so he wants Ron and I mean Harry and Hermione to take care of him somehow. So that's uh, where we left off. This is the new setup, everybody. This is the new setup. Uh, Peter pa Peter Potter picked a peck of pickled pickled potters. I got a new setup here. Uh, it took me a while, but we got the mountains back in the background. We got Dobby here with Hagrid and his hat. This is this is my mom. This is me as a kid. Uh, my brother's right next to it. That's my dad on a dentist dentist chair he found in Greece on the side of the road. Uh, I got my books galore. That's uh, yeah, yeah. We yeah, th this is all. This is my room. So we, I, I'm I'm pretty happy with it. It's all a bit tighter. It's all a bit squishier, but that's cool with me. All right, everybody, let's get back into the reading. I've missed this. I'm happy to be back. All right, here we go. Can you even see that? Got a new light, so I don't know if you can even see that. You can. Cut. Maybe the pen's a bit, bit uh, faded. Got my glasses. <sighs> All right, chapter thirty-one, owls. Ron's euphoria at helping Griffin. Or oh, by, by the way, if the music's too loud or anything, you know, I had to shift some, a couple of things around. You let me know, okay? If it's too loud, too quiet, whatever it is. What's nope? No, haha. Uh, can't see it. Do it all over again. Did something go wrong? I, I hope not. Oh no, yeah, there we go, okay. Ron's euphoria at helping Gryffindor scrape the Quidditch cup was such that he couldn't settle to anything next day. All he wanted to do was talk over the match, so Harry and Hermione found it very difficult to find an opening in which to mention Grop. Not that either of them tried very hard. Neither was keen to be the one to bring Ron back to reality in quite such a brutal fashion. As it was another fine, warm day, they persuaded him to join them in, re in revising under the beech tree at the edge of the lake, where they had less chance of being overheard than in the common room. Ron was enjoying being patted on the back by every Gryffindor who walked past his chair, not to mention the occasional outburst of, Weasley is our king! But after a while, he gr agreed that some fresh air might do him some good. Hello, Barbara! Uh, okay, good. Everything's working. Awesome. They spread their books out in the shade of the beech tree and sat down while Ron talked them through his first save of the match for what felt like the dozenth time. Well, I mean, I'd already let, uh, let in that one of Davy, so I wasn't feeling all that confident, but I don't know. When Bradley came towards me just out of nowhere, I thought, you can do this. 
And I had and I had about a second to decide which way to fly, you know, because he looked like he was aiming for the right goal hoop. My right, obviously, his left, but I had a funny feeling that he was faint fainting? Fainting? F-E-I-N-T-I-N-G. Oh, that's like I think dodging. So I took the chance and flew left. His right, I mean, and well, you saw what happened. He concluded modestly, sweeping his hair back quite unnecessarily so that it looked, interestingly, windswept. Oh. And glancing around to see whether the people nearest to them, a bunch of gossiping third-year Hufflepuffs, had heard him. And then, when Chambers, Chambers came at me about five minutes later, What? Ron asked, having stopped mid-sentence at the look on Harry's face. Why are you grinning? I'm not, said Harry quickly and looked down at his transfiguration notes, attempting, attempting to straighten his face. The truth was that Ron had just reminded Harry forcibly of another Gryffindor Quidditch player, who had once sat rumpling his hair under this very tree. I'm just glad we won, that's all. Yeah, said Ron slowly, savoring the words. <laughs> we won. Did you see the look on Chang's face when Ginny got the snitch right from, uh, from under her nose? I suppose she cried, did she? Said, oh, I suppose she cried, did she? Said Harry bitterly. Uh, did you upgrade your book holder or is it still the trusty hanger? It's still the, the trusty book holder 3000. Yeah, but the same thing. It, it works out for me. <laughs> um, well, yeah, more out of temper than anything, though. Ron frowned slightly. But you saw her chuck her broom away when she got back to the ground, didn't you? Uh, said Harry. Well, well, actually, no, Ron, said Hermione with a heavy sigh, putting down her book and looking at him apologetically. As a matter of fact, the only bit of the match Harry and I saw were Davy's first goal. Ron's carefully ruffled hair seemed to wilt with disappointment. You didn't watch, he said faintly, looking from one to the other. You didn't see me make any of those saves. Well, no said Hermione, stretching out a placatory hand towards him. Ron, we didn't want to leave. We had to. Yeah, said Ron, whose face was growing rather red. How come? It was Hagrid, said Harry. He decided to tell us why he's been covered in injuries ever since he got back from the Giants. He wanted us to go into the forest with him. We had no choice. You know how he gets. Anyway, the story was told in five minutes by the end of which Ron's indignation had re replaced by a look of total incredulity. Oh, I'm surprised. I thought he'd be kind of cranky for a while. But it seems like he's just, he got over it. Um, where are we? He bought one back and hid it in the forest? Yep, said Harry grimly. No, said Ron, as though by saying this he could make it untrue. No, he can't have. Ugh, book holder 3000 work better. I'm gonna have to fix this a little bit. It's there's gonna be hiccups along the way. Well, he has, said Hermione firmly. Groups about 16 feet tall, enjoys ripping up 20 foot pine trees, and knows me, she snorted. As Hermy, Ron gave a nervous laugh, and Hagrid wants us to teach him English. Yep, yeah, said Harry. He's lost his mind said Ron in an almost awed voice. Yes, said Hermione irritably, turning a page of intermediate transfiguration and glancing at a series of diagrams showing an owl turning into a pair of opera glasses. Yes, I'm starting to think he has, but unfortunately, he made Harry and me promise. Well, you're just going to have to break your promise, that's all, said Ron firmly. I mean, come on. We've got, exa we've got exams, and we're about that far. He held up his hand to show thumb and forefinger almost touching, touching, from being chucked out as it, as it is. And anyway, remember Norbert? Remember Aragog? Have we ever come off better for mixing with any of Hagrid's monster mates? I know, it's just that we promised, said Hermione in a small voice. Ron smoothed his flat hair flat again. Looking preoccupied. Oh, so he went from he went from flared out superhero, super uh, yeah hero of the the match to oh I'm just back to normal Ron. 
He's turning into his brother, his older brother, always talks like this, yeah. Well, he sighed. Hagrid hasn't been sacked yet, has he? He's hung on this long. Maybe he'll hang on till the end of term and we won't have to go near Grop at all. My mom just asked about the dex cam. Oh, yes, uh, that's one thing, because uh, his bed is a bit further away. It's not, you know, underneath the desk anymore, because it's just, it's, it's a tighter room, there's too much under there, so I have to find a USB extension cord so that I can have his dex um, area. So that will still be coming, his little dex cam. She's a casual watcher. Dean, who's Dean? So pumped. Car car hey, Danielle, welcome, Danielle. Okay. The castle grounds were gleaming in the sunlight as though freshly painted. The cloudless sky smiled at itself. Oh, that's a bit too loud for me now, actually. Music's a tad too loud for me. Quiet down a little bit. I'm trying to sleep. What's going on? Here we go. I'm going to start it over. There we go. That's better. Okay. The castle grounds were gleaming in the sunlight, as though freshly painted. The cloudless sky smiled at itself in the smoothly sparkling lake. The satin green lawns rippled occasionally in a gentle breeze. June had arrived. But to the fifth years, this meant only one thing. Their owls were upon them at last. Their teachers were no longer setting them, setting them homework. Lessons were devoted to revising those topics the teachers thought most likely to come up in the exams. The purposeful, feverish atmosphere drove nearly everything, but the owls from Harry's mind, though he did wonder occasionally during Potion's lesson, whether Lupin had ever told Snape that he must continue giving Harry occlumency tuition. Uh, tuition? Yeah, tuition. Tuition. Turning up a little bit. Okay, that's about the good level for me. Um, if he had, then Snape had ignored Lupin as thoroughly as he was now ignoring Harry. Uh, this suited Harry very well. He was quite busy and tense enough without extra classes with Snape. And to his relief, Hermione was much too preoccupied these days to badger him about occlumency. She was spending a lot of time muttering to herself and had not laid out any elf clothes for days. Uh, she was, not, she was not the only person acting oddly as the owls drew steadily nearer. Ernie McMillan had d developed an irritating habit of interrogating people about their revision practices. Ernie McMillan. Oh gosh, I forgot to revise that guy's... Uh, uh, who's Ernie McMillan again? Is he, is he one of the nerdy uh, little young, young brothers, those two kids? That talks like this? Or Oh, oh gosh. Sorry, this is going to happen a couple of times now. Because there's so many characters. The posh ones. Sn oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, Ernie McMillan had developed an irritating habit of interrogating people about their revision practices. How many hours do you think you're doing a day? He demanded of Harry and Ron as they queued outside Herbology. Oh, yeah, a bit more. A, a manic gleam in his eyes. I don't know, said Ron. A few. M more, or less than uh, more or less than eight. Less. I suppose, said Ron, looking slightly alarmed. I'm doing eight, said Ernie, puffing out his chest. Eight or nine. I'm getting an hour in before breakfast every day. Eight's my average. I can do ten on a good weekend day. I did nine and a half on Monday. Not so good on Tuesday. Only seven and a quarter. Then on Wednesday, Harry was deeply thankful that Professor Sprout ushered them into a greenhouse, into greenhouse three at that point, forcing Ernie to abandon his recital. Meanwhile, Draco Malfoy had found a different way to induce panic. Draco Malfoy! Oh, evil kid of the bunch! Uh, where is he? Draco Malfoy. Of course, it's not what you know, he was heard to tell Crabane Goyel loudly outside potions a few days before the exams were to start. It's who you know. Now, father's been friendly with the head of the Wizarding Examinations Authority for years. Old Griselda Marchbanks. We've had her round for dinner and everything. Do you think it's, do you think that's true? Hermione whispered in alarm to Harry and Ron. Nothing we can do about it if it is, said Ron gloomily. Uh, I don't think it's true, said Neville quietly from behind them. Oh yeah, Neville is slowly growing up too. I don't think it's true, 
because Griselda Marchbanks is a friend of my grand's, and she never mentioned the Malfoys. What's she like, Neville? asked Hermione at once. Is she strict? Bit like Gran, really, said Neville in a subdued voice. Knowing her won't hurt your chances, though, will it? Ron told him encouragingly. No, oh, I don't think it will make any difference, said Neville, still more miserably. Gran's always telling Professor Marchbanks I'm not as good as my dad. Well, you saw what she's like at St. Mungo's. Neville looked fixedly at the, at the floor. Harry, Ron, and Hermione glanced at each other, but didn't know what to say. It was the first time Neville had acknowledged that they had met at the Wizarding Hospital. Meanwhile, a flourishing black market trade in aids to concentration, mental agility, and wakefulness had sprung up among the fifth and seven years. Harry and Ron were much tempted by the bottle of Barufio's brain elixir offered to them by Ravenclaw sixth year Eddie Carmichael, who swore it was solely responsible for the nine outstanding owls he had gained the previous summer and was offering a whole pint for a mere twelve galleons. Ron assured Harry he would reimburse him for his half the moment he left Hogwarts and got a job, but before they could close the deal, Hermione had confiscated the bottle from Carmichael and poured the contents down a toilet. <laughs> Of course, Ron and Harry, I was like, oh, a scam? Yeah, we're in. Yeah, a scam? <laughs> totally. We don't think we're at with our heads. Hermione, ever the clever one. Okay. Hermione, we wanted to buy that, shouted Ron. Don't be stupid, she snarled. You might as well take uh, Harold Dingle's powdered dragon claw and have done with it. Dingle's got... Powdered dragon claw, said Ron eagerly. Not any more, said Hermione. I confiscated that too. None of those things actually work, you know. Dragon claw does work, said Ron. It's supposed to be incredible. Really gives your brain a boost. You come, you come over all cunning for a few hours. Hermione, let me have a pinch. Go on, it can't hurt. This stuff can, said Hermione grimly. I've had a look at it. And it's actually dried doxy droppings. <laughs> this information took the edge of Harry and Ron's desire for brain stimulants. What's a doxy? doxy? But also, there's a whole bunch of kids just drinking poo. Mmm. <laughs> circa last night. Mmm. Burrito. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, this information took the edge of Harry and Ron's desire for brain stimulants. Oh, you can't hear the music either. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Another thing I have to fix for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so you just saw a huge zoom up on my eyes. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I guess I'll have to fix that for tomorrow too. Yay! Uh, they received their examination timetables and details of the procedure for owls during the next Transfiguration lesson. Ah. Uh, beautiful, lovely Scotland. That's my way to get into the, the, the Scottish accent. As you can see, Professor McGonagall told the class as they copied down the dates and times for their exams from the blackboard. Your owls are spread over, the, over two successive weeks. You will sit the... the uh, you will sit the theory papers in the mornings and the practice in the afternoon. Uh, afternoons. Your, uh, your practical astronomy examination will, of course, take place at night. Now, I must warn you that the most stringent anti-cheating charms have been applied to your examination papers. Ought, ought, to, uh, ought to answer quills are banned from the examination hall, as are remembrals, detachable cribbing cuffs and self-correcting ink. Every year, I'm afraid to say, seems to harbour at least one student who thinks that he or she can get around the Wizarding Examinations Authority's rules. I can only hope that there's nobody in Gryffindor. Our new headmistress, Professor McGonagall pronounced the word with the same look on her face that Aunt Petunia had whenever she was contemplating a particularly stubborn bit of dirt ask the heads of house to tell their students that cheating will be punished most severely because of course your examination results 
will reflect, will reflect upon the headmistress's new regime at the school. Professor McGonagall gave a tiny sigh. Harry saw the nostrils of her sharp nose flare. However, that is no reason to, not to do your very best. You, ha you have your own futures to think about. Please, Professor, said Hermione, her hand in the air. When, we, when will we find out about our, find out our, our results? And I will, will be, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of practice. Oh man, I'm like, I'm working through this. Like I, I did it for every day for months on end. And then I went almost an entire, no, not almost. I went over an, a month of not doing this. I'm, uh, I'm out of practice. Uh, I mean, who's hearing breaks in the money to watch holes now? Hearing breaks in the music. Oof. Things are happening. Can't even hear the music. Huh. Can, can can people hear the music? Important nobody's mom? <laughs> Hello, welcome. <laughs> we got important nobody and her mom on the stream. That's awesome. Wait, how, how can some people hear the music and some people cannot hear the music? Not really, nope, 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 I can't a bit. So it's just a bit too quiet. Eh? Okay, I'm gonna turn it up a bit. Let me know if you can hear it. Turning it up. Okay, can you hear it now? Let me know. <laughs> um, uh, Dean Thomas. Oh yeah, excellent, said Dean Thomas in an audible whisper. So we don't have to worry about it till the holidays. Harry imagined sitting in his bedroom in Privet Drive in six weeks time, waiting for his owl results. Uh, well, he thought dully, at least he would be sure of one bit of post that summer. Their first examination, Theory of Charms, was scheduled for Monday morning. Harry agreed to test Hermione after lunch on Sunday, but regretted it almost at once. She was very agitated and kept snatching the book back from him to check that she had got the answer completely right. Finally hitting hard on the nose with a sharp edge of achievements in charming. Why don't you just do it yourself? She, he, oh no, why don't you just do it yourself? He said firmly, handing the book back to her, his eyes watering. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, Ron was reading two years worth of charms notes with his fingers in his ears, his lips moving soundlessly. Seamus Finnegan was lying flat on his back on the floor, reciting the definition of a substantive, substantive charm while Dean checked it against the standard book of spells, grade five. And Parvati and Lavender, who were practicing basic locomotion charms, were making their pencil cases race around each other on the edge of the table. Dinner was, subdued, was a subdued affair that night. Harry and Ron did not talk much, but ate with gusto, having studied hard all day. Hermione, on the other hand, kept putting down her knife and fork and driving under the table for her bag, from which she would seize a book to check some fact or figure. Ron was just telling her that she ought to eat a decent meal or she would not sleep that night, when her fork slid from her limp fingers and landed with a loud tinkle on her plate. Oh my goodness, she said faintly, staring into the entrance hall. Is that them? Is that the examiners? Harry and Ron whipped around on their bench. Through the doors to the Great Hall, they could see Umbridge standing with a small group of ancient-looking witches and wizards. Umbridge. I can't hear that either, but at least you can see Mark. Hey, Mark, I hope you're still on. <laughs> uh... Shall we, ha shall we go and have a closer look, said Ron. Harry and Hermione nodded, and they hastened towards the double doors into the entrance hall, slowing down as they stepped over, over the threshold to walk separately, uh, no, sedately, sedatedly, past the examiners. Harry thought Professor Marchbanks must be, ti must be the tiny. Uh, start writing down, uh, I don't know if I, they, they're going to speak now, but if you know the book and if you know these prof professors and witches or wizards are going to speak soon, give me some, based on the book, some adjectives. Not based on the movies, but based on the book, some adjectives, just adjectives, so that I can uh, develop a voice for these characters. A mute boo. Oh, I'm going to fix all that for tomorrow. Just you wait. 
Uh, okay. Harry thought Professor Marchbanks must be the tiny stooped witch with a face so lined it looked as though it had been draped in cobwebs. Umbridge was speaking to her deferentially. Oh, okay. Professor Marchbanks seemed to be a little deaf. <laughs> she was answering Professor Umbridge very loudly, considering they were only a foot apart. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, uh, Professor Marchbanks, she's a tiny stooped witch, tiny and stooped, but she's... Thanks very loudly. I like this. Yeah. Journey was fine. Journey was fine. We've made it plenty of times before. She no, that's a bit loud. I'll, I'll figure out her voice. Um, she said impatiently. Nah, I haven't heard from Dumbledore lately. She added, peering around the hall, <laughs> as though hope, as though hopefully he might suddenly emerge from a broom cupboard. No idea where he is. I suppose. <laughs> Oh yeah, Umbridge. None at all, said Umbridge, shooting a mal uh, malevolent look at Harry, Ron, and Hermione, who were now dawdling around the foot of the stairs as Ron pretended to do, up, to, to, to do up his shoelace. But I dare say the Ministry of Magic will track him down soon enough. Uh, I doubt it, shouted tiny Professor Marchbanks. Not if Dumbledore doesn't want to be found. <laughs> <laughs> She's not, she's not evil. I think she's just hard of hearing, probably. <laughs> That's it. Uh, I should know. Examined him personally in Transfiguration and Charms. When he did newts, uh, did things with a wand I'd never seen before. Yes. Mm, well, <laughs> said Professor Umbridge as Harry, Ron, and Hermione dragged their feet up the marble staircase as slowly as they, as they dared. Let me show you to the staff room. I dare say you'd like a cup of tea after your journey. It was an uncomfortable sort of an, e of an, e of an evening. Everyone was trying to do some last minute revising, but nobody seemed to be getting very far. Harry went to bed early, but then lay awake for what felt like hours. He remembered his career's consultation and McGonagall's furious declaration that she would help him become an Auror if it was the last thing she did. He wished he was he had expressed a more achievable, achievable ambition now that the exam time was here. He knew he was not the only one lying awake, but none of the others in the dormitory spoke, and finally, one by one, they fell asleep. Um... None of the fifth years talked very much at breakfast next day, either. Parvati was procra uh, pro practicing incantations under her breath, while the salt cellar in front of her twitched. What? The salt cellar twitched? Oh, oh it's, uh, it's, I think the salt shaker. Maybe it's a different word for shaker. Cellar. Interesting. Hermione was rereading Achievements in Charming so fast that her eyes appeared blurred. And Neville kept dropping his knife and fork and knocking over the marmalade. <laughs> it just oh, it, oh, oh. Once breakfast was over, the fifth and seven years milled around in the entrance hall, while the other students went off to lessons. Then, at half past nine, they were called forwards cla for they were called forwards class by class to re-enter the great hall, which which had been arranged exactly as Harry had seen it in the pensive when his father, Sirius, and Snape had been taking their owls. The four house tables had been removed and replaced instead with many tables for one, all facing the staff table end of the hall, where Professor McGonagall stood facing them. When they were all seated and quiet, she said, You may begin, and turned over an enormous hourglass on the desk beside her, on which there were also spare quills, ink bottles, and rolls of parchment. Harry turned over his paper, his heart thumping hard. Three rows to his right and four seats ahead, Hermione was already scribbling and lowered his eyes to the first question. A. Give the incantation and B. Describe the wand movement required to make objects fly. Harry had a fleeting memory of a club soaring high into the air and landing loudly on the thick skull of a troll. Smiling slightly, he bent over the paper and began to write. Of course, like all of his experience is going to help him. All of his all different adventures and like he's actually used it in real life. So this that's gonna be uh yeah. I think he, okay he, he, 
Uh, let's see. Oh, I, there's no use in doing the premonition song because you won't hear it. But uh, my premonition is uh, Harry's. No. Let me let me see. I think how will uh, how will Rowling surprise us here? I think that Hermione is gonna do. She's gonna still gonna pass. She's gonna do fine, but she's not gonna be hundred percent, and that's gonna upset her a lot. She's gonna be. Not average, not excellent, but just good. That's that's her owls that she's gonna get back. Um, uh, Harry's gonna do quite well, and Ron's gonna do. Oh, <laughs> what if Ron does better than Hermione? Yeah, Ron's gonna do better than Hermione. <laughs> that's gonna be that. That'll be really good. Uh, Prem an idiot, idiot. It's time for John's premonition. Okay, that's my premonition. Uh, well, it wasn't too bad, was it? Asked Hermione anxiously in the entrance hall two hours later, still clutching the exam paper. I'm not sure I did myself justice on shearing charms. I just ran. I just ran out of time. Did you put in the counter charm for hiccups? I wasn't sure whether I ought to. It felt like too much. And on question twenty-three. Hermione, said Ron sternly, we've been through this before. We're not going through every exam afterwards. It's bad enough doing them once. The fifth years ate lunch with the rest of the school. The four house tables had reappeared for the lunch hour. Then they trooped off into the small chamber beside the great hall, where they were to wait until called for their practical examination. As small groups of students were called forwards in alphabetical order, those left behind muttered incantations and practiced wand movements, occasionally poking each other in the back or eye by mistake. Uh, Lois isn't here tonight, but Carrie is uh, Carrie is uh, is doing that. Hermione's name was called. Trembling, she left the chamber with Anthony Goldstein, Gregory Goyle, and Daphne Greengrass. Students who had already been tested did not, did not return afterwards. So Harry and Ron had no idea how Hermione had done. Oh, she'll be fine. Remember she got 112% on one of our charms test? Said Ron. Ten minutes later, Professor Flitwick called, Parkinson, Pansy, Patil, Padma, Patil, Pavati, Potter, Harry. Good luck, said Ron quietly. Harry walked into the great hall, clutching his wand so tightly his hand shook. Professor Tufty is free, Potter, squeaked Professor Fl Flitwick, who was standing just inside the door. He pointed Harry towards what looked like the very oldest and baldest examiner who was sitting behind a small table in a far corner, a short distance from Professor Marchbanks, who was halfway through testing Draco Malfoy. Okay, what's his name? Um, Professor Tufty. Tofty. Old and bald. Very old and bald. Very old. Okay, okay. Um, uh, important nobody's mom. Again, uh, I love doing this to my child. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. Uh, important nobody. <laughs> you must be cringing because that's what we all do when, when our parents log on and do anything. But hey, your mom's awesome. Very funny. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, uh, Professor Tofty, l l let me tr you, you feel free to give me some adjectives. I'm gonna experiment experiment around with him. Very old and bald. Very old and bald. That's no maybe that's kind of boys. Butter, you think? Butter, 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 butter. There we go. Butter, 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 butter. butter. There we go. Uh, very old. Butter, is it? said Professor Tofty, consulting his notes and peering over his prince prince nez Prince nez? What's that? Pince nez. P I N C E uh, uh, hyphen N E Z Z. I don't know what that is. As Harry uh, at Harry as he approached. The famous Potter. On the corner of his eye, Harry distinctly saw Malfoy throw a scathing look over at him. The wine glass Malfoy had been levitating fell to the floor and smashed. Harry could not suppress a grin. Professor Tofty smiled back at him encouragingly. Uh, they're really small glasses that balance on the tip of the nose. Oh, oh, that's those dope glasses. It's like in the Matrix. <laughs> of course I'm talking about the Matrix, but uh, Morpheus, you know those glasses he just puts on top of his nose? Are those like the coolest pins and glasses? 
Is that basically the same thing? I think so. Uh, okay. Um, he, he Professor Hofti smiled back at him encouragingly. That's it, he said in his quavery old voice. No need to be nervous. Now, if I could ask you to take this egg cup and make it to do some cartwheels for me. On the whole, Harry thought it went rather well. His levitation charm was certainly not m much better than Malfoy's had been, though he wished he had not mixed up the incantations for color change and growth charms, so that the rat he was supposed to be turning orange swelled shockingly and was the size of a badger before Harry could rectify his mistake. He was glad Hermione had not been in the hall at, the t at that time, and neglected to mention it to her afterwards. He could tell Ron, though. Ron had caused a dinner plate to mutate into a large mushroom and had no idea how it had happened. <laughs> there was no time to relax that night. They went straight to the common room after dinner and submerged themselves in revision for transfiguration next day. Harry went to bed with his head buzzing with complex spell models and theories. He forgot the definition of a switching spell during his written paper next morning. I need to drink something. Way less cool than Morpheus. Okay, it's the same glasses. Same, uni same universe. Harry Potter and Matrix, same universe. Uh, hey, Max, welcome back. Uh, uh, he forgot the definition of a switching spell during his written paper next morning, but thought his practical could have been a lot worse. At least he managed to vanish the whole of his iguana, whereas poor Harry Abbott, Hannah Abbott, Hannah Abbott lost her head completely at the next table and somehow managed to mul multiply her ferret into a flock of flamingos. That's awesome. I would love to be a part of that. As in, I would like to see it not be part of the flamingos. Although that would be cool too. Just hanging around with a bunch of bird buddies. Causing the examination to be halted for 10 minutes while the birds were captured and carried, carried out of the hall. The scar is there, Max, but it's just uh, very faint. I'm going to have to find a stronger one. This is... This one's slowly faint. Oh, you know what the problem is? Because I used the old one. Bye-bye! I was actually supposed to use, uh, use the one that Lois gave me. Uh, that's better. Oh, there it is. There's that baby scar. There's that baby scar. Okay. They had their herbology exam on Wednesday. Other than a small bite from a fanged ger geranium, Harry felt he had done reasonably well. And then, on Thursday, defense against the dark arts. Here, for the first time, Harry felt sure he had passed. He had no problem with any of the written questions and took particular pleasure, during the practical examination, in performing all the counterjinxes and defensive spells right in front of Umbridge, who was watching coolly from near the doors into the entrance hall. Uh, uh... Oh, bravo! cried Professor Tofty, who was examining Harry again, when Harry demonstrated a perfect bogger to banishing spell. Very good indeed! Well, I think that's all, Potter. Unless... He leaned forwards a little. I heard from my dear friend Tiberius Ogden that you can produce a Patronus. For a bonus point? Harry raised his wand, looked directly at Umbridge and imagined her being sacked. Expecto Patronum, or Expecto Patronum, gift. His silver stag erupted from the end of his wand and cantered the length of the hall. All of the examiners looked around, oh wait, oh wait, ow, oh, ow, oh. I turned around, oh, I turned around way too quickly there. See, that's, that's a problem. Um, uh, where can I find it? I, I gotta, uh, anyway, I got a gift, I'll show, I'll show the gifts tomorrow. I, I just didn't have them ready here. Ooh, that, that actually hurt a little bit. Ooh. Um, his silver stag erupted from the end of his wand and cantered the length of the hall. All of the examiners looked around to watch its progress. And when it dissolved into silver mist, Professor Tofty clapped his veined and knotted hands enthusiastically. Excellent, he said. Very well, Potter. Oh, wait, Professor to to Tofty, that's a different one. Very well, Potter. You may go. As Harry passed Umbridge beside the door, their eyes met. There was a nasty smile playing around her wide, slack mouth, but he did not care. Unless he was very much mistaken, and he was not planning on telling anybody in case he was, he had just achieved an outstanding owl. Mm. 
Do not injure yourself again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, do they ever say what Harry does to make the Bogger Dementors funny, or does he just do expected Patronum? I have no idea. No idea. Yeah, because this is my first time reading. Um, as Harry passed Umbridge beside the... Oh, wait. Uh, on Friday, Harry and Ron... Uh, had a day off while Hermione sat her ancient room's exam. And as they had the whole weekend in front of them, they permitted themselves a break from revision. They stretched and yawned beside the open window, through which warm summer air was wafting as they played wizard chess. Harry could see Hagrid in the distance, teaching a class on the edge of the forest. He was trying to guess what creatures they were examining. He thought it must be unicorns because the boys seemed to be standing back a little. When the portrait hole opened and Hermione clambered in, looking thoroughly bad-tempered. How are the runes? Uh, how are the runes? said Ron, yawning and stretching. I mistranslated Ewas, said Hermione furiously. It means partnership, not defense. I mixed it up with Awas. I, I have no idea what she's talking about. I have no idea what the, the runes. Okay. Ah, well, said Ron lazily. That's only one mistake, isn't it? You'll still get... Oh, shut up, said Hermione angrily. <laughs> It could be the it could be the one mistake that makes the difference between a pass and a fail. And what's more, somebody's put another nifflet in, in in Umbridge's office. I don't know how they got in through that new door, but I just walked past there, and Umbridge is shrieking her head off. By the sound of it, it tried to take a chunk out of her leg. Good, said Harry and Ron together. It's not good, said Hermione hotly. She thinks it's Hagrid doing it, remember? And we do not want Hagrid chucked out. He's teaching at the moment. She can't blame him said Harry, gesturing out of the window. Oh, you're so na na naive, naive, naive. <laughs> oh, you're so na na... I, wait, wait, wait. I, I think I genuinely have forgotten how to say that word because I... You know when you say a word too often? Naive? Naive? Na naive? Na naive? I can't remember how to say the word. I, I swear, I just forgot just in this moment. This happens to me. Uh, oh wait, uh, about the runes. Uh, uh, ridiculous is the spell to turn the bog. Wait, those are the two runes with similar names of very different meanings. Okay, just a little pause a bit. Naive. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my 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 head bunked out there in a in a moment. Conked out. Got your conk. Okay, where were we? Uh, you're so naive sometimes. Na <laughs> naive. You're so. Oh, you're so naive sometimes, Harry. You really think Umbridge will wait for proof? She's hot-tempered right now, said Hermione, who seemed determined. Oh, hey, buddy. He wants up. Little guy wants up. Here he is. For everybody who's missing the Dexter cam, there's a the little guy. Hey? Yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, Harry, you, re you really think Umbridge will wait for proof? Said Hermione, who seemed determined to be in a towering temper. Uh, and she swept off towards the girls' dormitories, banging the door behind her. Such a lovely, sweet-tempered girl, said Ron, very quietly, prodding his queen forward to beat up one of Harry's knights. I don't know, but I think rolling... I don't know. Like, prodding his queen forward, sweet-tempered girl, I think that's kind of connected. I don't know, that, that feels connected to me. Hermione's bad mood persisted for most of the weekend, though Harry and Ron found it quite easy to ignore as they spent most of Saturday and Sunday revising for potions on Monday, the exam which Harry had been looking forward to least, and which he was sure would be the downfall of his ambitions to become an Auror. Um, sure enough, he found the written paper difficult, though he thought he might have got full marks in the questions about Polyjuice Potion. He could describe, describe its effects accurately, having taken it illegally in his second year. The afternoon practical was not as dreadful as he had expected it to be. With Snape absent from the proceedings, he found that he was much more relaxed than he usually, than he usually was while making potions. Neville, who was sitting very near Harry, also looked happier than Harry had ever seen him during the potions class. When Professor Marchbanks said, Step away! <laughs> Step away from your cauldrons, please! The examination is over. Harry corked his simple flask, feeling that he might not have achieved a good grade, but he had, with luck, avoided a fail. Only four exams left, 
said Parvati Patil wearily, as they headed back to Gryffindor Common Room. Only, said Hermione snappishly, I've got arithmancy and it's probably the toughest subject there is. She is stressing out. Hermione is stressing out. <laughs> hey, Thomas, thank you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Nobody was foolish enough to snap, snap back, so she was unable to vent her spleen on any of them and was reduced to telling off some first years for giggling too loudly in the common room. Harry was determined to perform well in Tuesday's care of magical creatures exams so as not to let Hagrid down. The practical examination took place in the afternoon on the lawn of the edge of the Forbidden Forest, where students were required to correctly identify the gnarl hidden among a dozen hedgehogs. The trick was to offer them all milk in turn. Gnarls, highly suspicious creatures whose quills had many magical properties, generally went berserk at what they saw as an attempt to poison them. Oh. <laughs> Just anything, okay. Then demonstrate correctly handing of a bow truckle. Feed and... Cl I, I wish... I, I don't know if these are all new creatures, but there have been so many creatures introduced that I can't keep them straight in my head. I don't know which ones are which anymore. I wish I had the, the, the image of them. Feed and clean uh, out a fire crab without sustaining serious burns, and choose from a wide selection of food the diet they would give a sick unicorn. Harry could see Hagrid watching anxiously out of his uh, cabin window, when Harry's examiner, a plump little witch this time, smiled at him and told him he could leave. Harry gave Hagrid a fleeting thumbs up before heading back to the castle. The astronomy theory paper on Wednesday morning went well enough. Harry was not convinced he had got the names of all Jupiter's moons right, but was at least confident that none of them was in inhabited by mice. What? The names of Jupiter's moons? Inhabited by mice? What? <laughs> uh, so they're, they're, these witches, wizards, they're basically like, yeah, we know the moons and there's a bunch of mice on this planet. They have uh, their own little civilization. Over here, we got some llamas I'm taking care of that planet. Is that, is that a thing? Is that a thing in this world? Most of not all these creatures have been covered in this or earlier books. There's a creature we're going to tell you every time they appear. It's a sort of spoilers, right? Yeah. The character com 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 uh, compendium book should help with peoples and creatures, which I got right there. It's right there. Callback. That's a throwback to when Ron actually wrote mice instead of ice. Oh, that's a little throwback. Huh. That's funny. Um... Okay, where we went. Even by Harry's low standards in divination, the exam went very badly. He might as well have tried to see moving pictures on the desktop as in the stubbornly blank crystal ball. He lost his head completely during tea leaf reading, saying it looked to him as though Professor Marchbanks would shortly be meeting a round, dark, soggy stranger, and ran it off the whole fiasco by mixing up the life and headlines on her palm, and informing her that she ought to have died the previous Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, well, we were always going to fail that one, said Ron gloomily, as they ascended the marble staircase. He had just made Harry feel rather better by telling him how he had t told the examiner in detail about the ugly man with a wart on his nose and his crystal ball, only to look up and realize he had been describing his examiner's reflection. We shouldn't have- <laughs> that's funny. We shouldn't have taken the stupid subject in the first place, said Harry. Still, at least we can give it up now. Yeah, said Harry. No more, no more pretending we care what happens when Jupiter and Uranus get too friendly. And now, and from now on, I don't care if my tea leaves spell die, Ron, die. I'm just chucking them in the bin where they belong. I love Ron. He's just so... I love his... He's very dry. He's dry. I love him. Harry laughed, just as Hermione came running up behind them. He stopped laughing at once, in case it annoyed her. <laughs> Just like, walking around on eggshells. <laughs> well, I think I've done all right in arithmancy, she said, and Harry and Ron both sighed with relief. Just time for a quick look over our star charts before dinner, then. Oh, it's evening time. How about we change up the lighting a bit? Yeah, there we go. I think that works out, eh? Uh, I don't know what's going on. Okay, there we go. 
We got a little, a little different uh, atmosphere in here. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, by the way, these that, th those are little uh, sprinkly red lights. That's from Mark. Mark, uh, before he left and moved, had a bunch of lights, and I chose those two, and it just adds a little cool effect. I like it. Uh, okay, let's keep going. Uh, what time is it? I'll go for another 15. I know, because I started late. <laughs> All these problems. Okay. Mm. Uh, uh, where are we? We're sorry, I've completely lost my point. We can give it up now. There we go. <laughs> when they reached the top of the astronomy tower at 11 o'clock, they found a perfect night for stargazing, cloudless and still. The grounds were bathed in silvery moonlight, and there was a slight chill in the air. Each of them set up his or her telescope, and when Professor Marchbank gave the word, proceeded to fill in the blank star chart they'd been given. Professor Marchbanks and Tofty strolled among them, watching as they entered the precise positions of the stars and planets they were observing. All was quiet, except for the rustle of parchment, the occasional creak of a telescope as it was adjusted on its stand, and the scribbling of many quills. Half an hour passed, then an hour. The, li the little squares of reflected gold light flickering on the ground below them started to vanish as lights in the castle, castle windows were extinguished. As Harry completed the constellation Orion on his chart, however, the front doors of the castle opened directly below the parapet where he was standing, so that light spilled down the stone steps a little way across the lawn. Harry glanced down as he made a slight adjustment to the position of his telescope and saw five or six elongated shadows moving over the brightly lit grass before the door, doors, doors swung shut and the lawn became a sea of darkness once more. Ooh, mystery. What's going to happen? Six figures across the lawn. Uh, hello. I love the decoration. Good. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> uh, uh, hello, Emma. Hi, Emma. Welcome. Up, Tasha, Tasha's on, on it. She, I already, she knew I didn't know what parapet is. Parapet, tiny balcony like Juliet stands on looking for a Romeo. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Harry put his eye back to his telescope and refocused it. <laughs> so funny. Now examining Venus, he looked down at his chart to enter the planet there, but something distracted him. Pausing with his squill suspended over the parchment, he squinted down into the shadowy grounds and saw half a dozen figures walking over the lawn. If they had not been moving and the moonlight had not been gliding the tops of their heads, they would have been dis indistinguishable from the dark grounds on which they walked. Even at this distance, Harry had a funny feeling he recognized the walk of the squattest of them, who seemed to be leading the group. He could not think why Umbridge would be taking a stroll outside after midnight much less accompanied by five others. Then somebody coughed behind him, and he remembered that he was halfway through an exam. He'd quite forgotten Venus's position. Jam jamming his eye to his telescope, he found it again, and was once more about to enter it on his chart when, alert for an, any odd sound, he heard a distant knock which echoed through the deserted grounds, followed immediately by the muffled barking of a large dog. They're going to visit Hagrid, what is going to happen? I do not know. He looked up, his heart hammering. There were lights on in Hagrid's windows, and the people he had observed crossing the lawn were now silhouetted against them. The door opened, and he distinctly saw six sharply defined figures walk over the threshold. The doors closed again, and there was silence. Harry felt very uneasy. He glanced around to see whether Ron or Hermione had noticed what he had. But Professor Marchbanks came walking behind him at that moment, and not wanting to look as though he was sneaking looks at anyone else's work, Harry hastily bent over his star chart and pretended to be adding notes to it while really peering over the top of the pa pa parapet towards Hagrid's cabin. Figures were now moving across the cabin windows, tempor temporarily bl blocking the, the, the light. He could feel Professor Marchbank's eyes on the back of his neck and pressed his eye again to his telescope, staring up at the moon, though he had marked its position an hour ago. But as Professor Marchbanks moved on, he heard a roar from the distant cabin that echoed through the, dar the darkness right to the top of the astronomy tower. 
Several of the people around Harry ducked out from behind their telescopes and peered, inst peered instead in, in the direction of Hagrid's cabin. Professor Tofty gave another dry little cough. Uh, uh, Tofty's the old dude, yeah. Try and concentrate now, boys and girls, he said softly. Most people returned to their telescopes. Harry looked to his left. Hermione was gazing transfixed at Hagrid's cabin. Um, uh, Twenty minutes to go, said Professor Tofty. Hermione jumped and returned at once to her star chart. Harry looked down at his own and noticed that he had mislabeled Venus and Mars. He bent to correct it. There was a loud bang from the grounds. Several people cried ouch when they poked themselves in the face with the ends of their telescopes as they hastened to see what was going on down below. Um, Hagrid's doors had burst open and by the light flooding out of the cabin they saw him quite clearly, a massive figure roaring and brandishing his fists surrounded by six people. Um, oh shoot. Uh, all of whom, judging by the tiny threads of red light they were casting in his direction, seemed to be attempting to stun him. No! cried Hermione. My dear, said Professor Toffee in a scandalized voice, this is an examination! But nobody was paying the slightest attention to their star charts anymore. Jets of red light were, all, were still flying about beside Hagrid's cabin, yet somehow they seemed to be bouncing off him. He was still upright and still, as far as Harry could see, fighting. Cries and yells echoed across the grounds. A man yelled, Be reasonable, Hagrid! Hagrid roared, Reasonable be damned! You won't take me... Oh, no, wait, wait uh, sorry, Hagrid, oh, no, no, no. Reasonable be damned! You won't take me like this, doorless! Hagrid could see... Uh, Harry could see the tiny outline of Fang attempting to fend Hagrid, leaping repeatedly at the wizard surrounding him until... Hey, this is crazy, y'all. I can see a stunning spell caught him. Come on, book holder 3000, work with me. There we go. I'm gonna work on you t today too. Oh, come on. Caught him and he fell to the ground. Haggard gave a howl of fury, lifted the culprit bodily from the ground and threw him. Holy smokes, what is going on? This is crazy. The man flew what looked like 10 feet and did not get up again. Hermione gasped. Both hands over her mouth, Harry looked round at Ron and saw that he, too, was looking scared. None of them had ever seen Hagrid in a real temper before. Yeah. Look, squealed Parvati, uh, who was leaning over the parapet and pointing to the foot of the castle where the front doors had opened again. More light was spilling out onto the dark lawn, and a single long black shadow was now rippling across the lawn. Now, really, said Professor Tofty anxiously, only 16 minutes left, you know. But nobody paid him the slightest attention. They were watching the person now sprinting towards the battle beside Hagrid's cabin. Uh, uh, I don't know who this is. Oh, it's McGonagall. How dare you? The, w uh, the figure shouted as she ran. How dare you? It's McGonagall, whispered Hermione. Leave him alone! Alone, I say! said Professor McGonagall's voice through the darkness. On what grounds are you attacking him? He has done nothing, nothing to warrant such... Hermione, Parvati, and Lavender all screamed. The figures around the cabin had shot no fewer than four stunners at Professor McGonagall. <laughs> what? Oh, man, what is going on? Ah... <sighs> Uh, halfway between cabin and castle, the red beams collided with her. For a moment, she looked luminous and glowed an eerie red. Then she lifted right off her feet, landed hard on her back, and moved no more. Galloping gargoyles! shouted Professor Tofty, who also seemed to have forgotten the exam completely. Not so much as a warning, outrageous behavior! Cowards! No, cowards! Oh, sorry, Hagrid, Hagrid. His voice like this, yelling, oh, cowards, bellowed Hagrid. His voice carried clearly to the top of the tower. And several lights flickered back on an inside of the castle. Ruddy cowards, have some of that, and that. Oh my, gasped Hermione. Harry took massive swipes at his closest attackers. Judging by their immediate collapse, they'd been knocked cold. Harry saw Hagrid double over and thought he had finally been overcome by a spell. But... 
On the contrary, next moment Hagrid was standing again with what happened to be a sack on his back. Then Harry realized that Fang's limp body was draped around his shoulder. Damn it. No, please, I hope, I hope, I hope Fang's okay. Um, get him! Get him! screamed Umbridge, but her remaining helper seemed highly reluctant to go within reach of Hagrid's fists. Indeed, he was backing away so fast he tripped over one of his unconscious colleagues and fell over. Hagrid had turned and begun to run with Fang still hung around his neck. Umbridge sent one last stunning spell after him, but it missed. And Hagrid, running full pelt towards the distant gates, disappeared into the darkness. Holy smokes! That was very unexpected. Wow. Well, the work of um, MCG. Oh, McGonagall. Oh man. Yeah, Boo Umbridge indeed. Boo, boo, boo. Wow. What the heck? There was long minutes, quivering silence, as everybody is gazed open mouth into the everybody gazed open mouth into the grounds. Then Professor Trofty's voice said feebly, five minutes to go, everybody." Though he had only though he had only filled in two thirds of his chart, Harry was desperate for the exam to end. When it came at last, he, Ron, and Hermione forced their telescopes haphazardly back into their holders and dashed back down the spiral staircase. None of the students were going to be were going to bed. They were all talking loudly and excitedly at the foot of the stairs about what they had witnessed. That evil woman gasped Hermione, who seemed to be having difficulty taking talking due to rage. Trying to sneak up on Hagrid in the dead of night. Um she clearly wanted to avoid another scene like Trelawney's, said Ernie McMillan sagely, squeezing over to join them. Hagrid did well, didn't he? said Ron, who looked more alarmed and impressed. How come all the spells bounced off him? It'll be his giant blood, said Hermione shakily. It's very hard to, to stun a giant. They're like trolls, really tough. But poor Professor McGonagall, four stunners straight in the chest, and she's not exactly young, is she? Dreadful, dreadful, said Ernie, shaking his head pompously. Well, I'm off to bed. Night, all. People around them were drifting away, still talking excitedly about what they had just seen. Um, sorry, what they had just seen. Yeah, at least at least they didn't get to take Hagrid off to Azkaban, said Ron. I suspect he's gone to join Dumbledore, hasn't he? I suppose so, said Hermione, who looked tearful. Oh, this is awful. I really thought Dumbledore would be back before long, but now we've lost Hagrid too. They tra Wow, this is crazy. All of their players, all the, the people on their side are being taken out. It's a lot. Oh, man. They traipsed back. To I'm going to see how much I have left in Owls. Oh, okay. I, I, I'll finish this chapter. It's another five pages, but uh, yeah, we'll go another ten minutes probably. They traipsed back to Gryffindor Tower common room to find a f to find it full. The commotion out in the grounds had woken several people who had hastened to rouse their friends. Seamus and Dean, who had arrived ahead of Harry, Ron, and Hermione, were now telling everyone what they had seen and heard from the top of the astronomy tower. Uh, Angelina Johnson. Uh, oh, she's the she's the right. She's the the Gryffindor. Uh, um, no, sorry, uh, the Quidditch captain. Right. Okay, yeah. But why sack Hagrid now? Asked Angelina Johnson, shaking her head. It's not like Tarani. He's been teaching much better than usual this year. Uh, Umbridge's hate, uh, Umbridge hates part humans, said Hermione bitterly, flopping down in a, into an armchair. She was always going to try and get Hagrid out. Katie Bell. And she thought Hagrid was putting Nifflers in her office, piped up Katie Bell. Oh, blimey said Lee, Jorney, co Lee Jordan, covering his mouth. It's me who's been putting the nifflers in her office. Fred and George left me in a couple. I've been, I've been, uh, I've been levitating them in through a window. Of course he has. She's, she'd, have, she'd have sacked him anyway, said Dean. He's too close to Dumbledore. <laughs> All these voices are screwed up, probably. That's true, said Harry, sinking into an armchair beside Hermione's. I just hope, uh, uh, Lavender... 
La right, Lavender Parv Parvati, they're slightly different. Ugh. Okay, I gotta go through that voice again. Uh, I just hope Professor McGonagall's all right, said Lav Lavender tearfully. Who's saying this? Colin Creevy, th there he is. They, ca they carried her back up to the... Uh, uh, he, oh, he's that little guy. They carried her back up to the castle. We watched through the dormitory window, said Colin Creevy. She didn't look very well. Alicia Spinnett. I've completely forgotten Alicia Spinnett. Who's she again? Oh, man. Uh, Alicia Spinnett. I can't remember her voice. Madame Pomfrey will sort her out, said Al Alicia Spinnett firmly. She's never failed yet. I forget her voice. It was nearly four in the morning before the common room cleared. Harry felt wide awake. The image of Hagrid sprinting away into the dark was haunting him. He was so angry with Umbridge. He could not think of a punishment bad enough for her. Though Ron's suggestion of having her fed to a box of starving blast-ended scroots had its merits. He fell asleep, contemplating hideous revenges, and arose from bed three hours later, feeling distinctly unrested. Their final exam, History of Magic, was not to take place until that afternoon. Harry would very much have liked to go back to bed after breakfast, but he had been counting on the morning for a spot of last-minute revision. So instead, he sat with his head in his hands by the common room window, trying hard not to doze off as he read through some of the three-and-a-half-feet-high stack of notes that Hermione had lent him. The fifth years entered the Great Hall at two o'clock and took their places... Oh, it's daytime again. Let's turn it back on today, hey? Um... The three and a foot, half foot high stack of notes that Hermione had left him. Oh. I swear, it's, yeah, I got a bit bumpy there. <laughs> Things are happening in the, <laughs> on my computer, I have no idea. <laughs> anyway. Um, another Gryffindor Quidditch person. Alicia's on the Quidditch team. Right, 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 the fifth years entered the Great Hall at two o'clock and took their places in front of their face-down examination papers. Harry felt exhausted. He just wanted this to be over so that he could go to sleep, and then tomorrow, he and Ron were going to go down to the Quidditch pitch. He was going to have to a fly in Ron's broom and savor their freedom from revision. Hand over your papers, said Professor Marchbank from the front of the hall, flicking over the giant hourglass. You may begin. Harry stared fixedly at the first question. It was several seconds before it occurred to him that he had not taken in a word of it. There was a wasp a buzzing distractedly against one of the high windows. Slowly, torturously, he at last began to write an answer. He was finding it very difficult to remember names and kept confusing dates. He simply skipped questions for, in your opinion, did one legislation contribute to or lead to a better control um, Sorry, at le or lead to better control of goblin riots of the 18th, 18th century, thinking that he would go back to it if he had time at the end. He had a stab at question five. How was the statue of secrecy breached in 1749, and what measures were introduced to, re to prevent a recurrence? Uh, just for the IT, say, when the thing popped up on your computer, you need to slow down. Yeah, I, I noticed that on mine, too. Thank you very much. Um... <laughs> okay, he established that question, but had a nagging suspicion that he had missed several important points. He had a feeling vampires had come into the story somewhere. He looked ahead for a question he could definitely answer, and his eyes alighted upon number 10. Describe the circumstances that led to the formation of the International Confederation of Wizards and explain why the warlocks of Liechtenstein refused to join. I know this, Harry thought. Though his brain felt torpid and slack, he could visualize a heading in Hermione's handwriting. The formation of the International Confederation of Wizards. Uh, he, he had read those notes only this morning. He began to write, looking up now and again to check, uh, to check the large hourglass on the desk beside, beside Professor Marchbanks. He was sitting right behind Pravati Patil, whose long dark hell fell, hair fell below the back of her chair. Once or twice he found himself stir, uh, staring at the tiny golden lights that glistened in it when she moved her head slightly and had to give his own head a little shake to clear it. Oh, interesting. Staring at Pravati Patil? Hmm. Um, 
The first supreme mugwump of the International Conf Confederation of Wizards was Pierre Bonacard, but his appointment was contested by the wizarding com uh, community of Liechtenstein because all around Harry, quills were scratching on parchment like scurrying, burrowing, scurry, scur scurrying, burrowing rats. The sun was very hot on the back of his head. What was it that Bonacard had done to offend the wizards of Liechtenstein? Harry had a feeling it had something to do with trolls. He gazed blankly at the back of Pravati's head again. If he could only perform legilimency. Legil there you go, I got it this time. And open a window in the back of her head and see what it was about trolls that had caused the breach between Pierre Bonacard and Liechtenstein. Harry closed his eyes and buried his face in his hands, so that the glowing red of his eye eyelids grew dark and cool. Bonacard had wanted to stop troll hunting and give the trolls rights, but Liechtenstein was having problems with a tribe of particularly vicious mountain trolls. That was it. He opened his eyes. They stung and watered at the sight of the blazing white parchment. Slowly, he wrote... Slowly, he wrote two lines about the trolls, then read through what he had done so far. It did not seem very informative or detailed, yet he was sure Hermione's notes on the Confederation had gone on for pages and pages. He closed his eyes again, trying to see them, trying to remember. The Confederation had met for the first time in France. Yes, he had written that already. Goblins had tried to attend and had been ousted. He had written that too. And nobody from Liechtenstein had wanted to come. Think, he told himself, his face in his hands, while all around him quills scratched out never-ending answers, and the sand trickled through the hourglass at the front. He was walking along the cool, dark corridor to the Department of Mysteries again, walking with a firm and, ooh, no, walking with a firm and purposeful tread, breaking occasionally into a run, determined to reach his destination at last. The black door swung open for him as, as usual. And here he was in the circular room with its many doors. Okay, okay. Let's, uh, let's, let's switch it up, hey? Bum, bum, bum. Uh, straight across the stone floor and through the second door, patches of dancing light on the walls and floor and that odd mechanical clicking, but no time to explore. He must hurry. He jogged the last few feet to the third door, which swung open just like the others. Once again, he was in the cathedral-sized room full of shelves and glass spheres. His heart was beating very fast now. He was going to get there this time. When he reached number 97, he turned left and hurried along the aisle between two rows. But there was a shape on the floor at the very end, a black shape moving on the floor like a wounded animal. Harry's stomach contracted with fear, with excitement. Uh, a vo oh, I'm sorry, this thing is... I know, I know it's a tense moment, but every time I press this lighting button, this program opens up, which I have to fix everything. Oh, no! Uh, okay, okay. There we go. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I, I thought I cancelled everything for a moment. <laughs> okay, um, okay, there's a hairy stomach contracted with fear, with excitement. A voice issued from his own mouth, a high, cold voice, empty of any human kindness. Take it from me. Lift it down now. I cannot touch it. But you can. The black shape on the floor shifted a little. Harry saw a long-fingered, white hand clutching a wand, ri a wand rise at the end of his own arm heard the high, cold voice say, Crucio! The man on the floor let out a scream of pain, attempted to stand but fell back, writhing. Harry was laughing. He raised his wand. The curse lifted, and the figure groaned and became motionless. Lord Voldemort is waiting. Oh, I thought this was Voldemort. I guess it's somebody else. Very slowly, his arms trembling, the man on the ground raised his shoulders a few inches and lifted his head. His face was blood-stained and gaunt, twisted in pain yet rigid with defiance. What? Serious? Oh, no! You have to kill me, whispered Sirius. Undoubtedly, I shall in the end, said the cold voice. 
but you will fetch it for me first. Black, you think you have felt pain thus far? Think again. We have hours ahead of us, and nobody to hear you scream. Uh-oh, uh-oh, this is not good. This is not good stuff. This is not good stuff. But somebody screamed as Voldemort lowered his wand again. Somebody yelled and fell, fell sideways off a hot desk under the cold stone floor. Harry awoke as he hit the ground, still yelling, his scar on fire, as the great hall erupted all around him. Oh, jeez. That's the end of the chapter. Chapter 32, Out of the Fire. Oh, man, what is going on in this business? Oh, okay, we're going to end there. I'll leave a little bit, little time for uh, interaction and questions, but what is going on? Oh, no, serious? He's got serious? Of course he's got serious. Sirius has been playing it way too risky. Oh, no. They're probably going to go on a quest now to try and save Sirius or something. I don't know. Intense tension. But if you wanted to keep going, we'd all be okay with it. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to end it there, but I'll be back tomorrow. Oh, uh, any, uh, yeah. Oof. Oof, 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 oof. They, they, they just, they, she just threw stuff in there in the middle of an exam, that crazy fight, and then just in the middle of this exam too. I mean, you kind of should expect that, that something should happen in the middle of an exam. It would throw everything off. Man, oh man, oh man. Premonition? Uh, um, yeah. Premon idiot. Idiot, it's time for John's Prime Manager. I think that um they will go, they will find out where Sirius is. And Harry, Ron, and Hermione will go on a little uh, fetch quest. <laughs> fetch quest. Uh, they, they will save, they will go to save uh, kidnapped Sirius. I'm guessing. Well, Harry definitely won't just stick around knowing that Sirius is uh, is in danger. Yeah, so that they will go and uh, help them out. I'm actually trying to do homework while listening. Powerful ch a chapter, yep, totally, Max. Cliffhangers suck. <laughs> Such a good singer. Oh, thank you. Fetch quest, and it's serious. Yeah, okay, that's it, it, it was fun reading again. It's fun reading again. I gotta get a haircut, too. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this nonsense. Um, yeah, everybody, that was fun. You have any uh, any questions? Anything you want to ask? Or we'll, I'm gonna be back tomorrow, same time, six o'clock. I don't know if you meant for that to be a pun or not, but it's funny. Fetch? What? Oh, fetch quest for Sirius because he's a dog. Because he put. Oh, oh, sorry, my neck hurt again. Ooh, I don't, there's a certain small, tiny movements that makes it hurt, make it hurt. I can't do anything about it until I get fixed by my Cairo. He who said it's gonna take three to six months, but I should be fixed. Uh, if you could have any wizarding job, what would you choose. Oh, a uh, wizarding job. I would choose... What were the jobs again? I would definitely choose uh, the the ones where, you know, where it's the most action. You know, like an Auror. I think I would choose an Auror. Yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> I don't like action. Take care of your neck, please. Thank you, Anna. Uh, we miss you and your readings. Thank you, Janessa. I've missed being here. I missed all of you. Your mic is sounding funny again. It held out. Oh, I guess it's... Just ending. I don't know what is going on with this mic. I have to fix it over tomorrow. I I don't know even know. If, is it still finding funny? We know you're a perfect of a nation teacher, John. <laughs> you know I am. <laughs> okay, everybody. I um we're, we're back again regularly. Um, you know I I'll tell you on the Discord if I can't make a day if it happens on the day. You know I'm reading when I can. Uh, but still, if I have important things to do or something that you know I'll be doing those. For example, this Wednesday I cannot. Uh, so I'll be doing Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, but we'll be back every single day. You know, seven chapters left. Yeah, we are close to the end of this book. We are very close. We're we're gonna we still have a little bit left. Man, it's gonna be it's gonna be a wild ride a bit from here on. I I don't think it's gonna go back to to regular school life. Definitely not. It's gonna be seven. I think it's gonna be seven chapters of of wild mayhem. That's that's my thoughts. Oh, and little Dexter is here again. Ah, oh, my little Dexter bazooka. Huh? 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 More more important than reading to us? <laughs> okay, friends. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, this is this is a lot of fun. Of course it is. I'm uh, very happy to be back. Love you all. And you have value, you have meaning, and you are loved.